disconnect for the next 45 minutes, we would appreciate it. Uh, it's, uh, it's an absolute delight uh, and a real pleasure to welcome back to the AA uh, Hanif Kara for tonight's lecture. Um, <coughs> uh, in a lecture that coincides with our, our lovely exhibition across the hall, a first ever opportunity uh, to put on a solo exhibition of the work of AKT, which coincides with the publication of the first decade of their work, uh, a book called Design Engineering, which we will be launching after this lecture downstairs in the lecture shop, uh, in the bookshop, for those of you that haven't got a copy yet, which I will strongly recommend for any number of reasons, but mostly for what Hanif will be presenting in the next 45 minutes to an hour here in the lecture hall. Uh, the exhibition across the way uh, comes in two forms. It's a combination purpose-built installation and a sampling of, of a few of the dozens of brilliant projects that AKT have been involved with uh, during the first 10 years of their practice <coughs> in London. Uh, Hanif's lecture tonight is titled, I see, Engineering, comma, a practice, and I think it's meant in, in pure English double reading way. This is an office that's incredibly strategic, and I would say self-aware about how they organize themselves, how they work and think as a practice, how that affects other practices, including especially the architects they work with, and in fact how they can be better engineering that alongside the brilliant projects that they've been involved in. Uh, I think it's fair to say that we live in a world of knowledge economies where figuring out how to learn from the things that you do is as important as what it is you do. I think that's very much more the case today, a few months after the fall of 08. Uh, than it was even last year, and I think there's no better example of that in the engineering world and certainly in design cultures across the world than in the ways in which AKT have thought through the future of engineering before it arrived and done so in both traditional form as consultants to some of the great architects around the world and in projects that many of you will already know, but also in their activities as educators and really I think as visionaries for design cultures for the future. Hanif reminded me as, as we started this evening by saying that it's been almost exactly 10 years since he first joined us here uh, at the AA <coughs> in a small uh, uh, experimental workshop on the topic of engineering and architecture that we put together in, I believe, the fall of 97 uh, over in the DRL. Um, we had three brilliant practices come in uh, to work with our students over a few weeks in a design workshop each of those practices went away and started building or prototyping the kind of projects that were emerging in the studio. And I think that prototyping sensibility, which runs very deeply through AKT and has been on evidence in any number of projects that Hanif and his collaborators and partners have been involved with here at the school, is a real testament to a kind of shift in contemporary architectural culture that many of us will know in different forms through the kinds of activities that take place here. Uh, some of the projects that AKT have worked on have been on exhibition here in the last couple of years. You will know some of these. Um, they're absolutely groundbreaking practices. AKT in its first decade of work have worked with FOA, um, Zaha Hadid Architects, Alsops, AHMM, Eric Perry, uh, and Foster and Partners and many others. Uh, the point being they seek out talent and ability and I think learn from that experience to make themselves better, but more than anything, I think really do affect the cultures within each of these offices. It's been a, a, a real honor and pleasure for us at the A to be able to work with Hanif over the last 10 years in many forms. Uh, he was the leader with Ciro Naj of a great diploma unit here that ran for four years or five years upstairs in the diploma school, and he's been back with his collaborators any number of times on pavilions and other projects and he reminds me that tonight is an opportunity for a first ever lecture to explain all of the activity that he's been working on. So please join me in welcoming Hanif Kara. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you AA, thank you Brett very much for that uh, moving introduction. It is true, um, if for 10 years I've been a part of the furniture here, but I've actually never spoken from this stage. Even when we did the unit, Ciro used to present on my behalf. So I'm barely nervous um, because I know the student audience is also pretty tough usually. I want to thank the AA. I want to thank Robin and Albert 
because I'm going to speak on behalf of Adam Skara Taylor and everyone else from Adam Skara Taylor, although I get all the, the press, you know, it's, it's about a, a massive team. I have also two particular um, things that make me nervous, and yeah, my wife, Sham, and my daughter, Iman, who's neither have ever heard me speak <laughs> about my work. In fact, I, I'm not allowed to speak about work often. <laughs> I have a, a surprise in the audience as well that I've really taken me back, John Roberts, who is one of the greatest engineers in the world, though most people don't know that, and was my inspiration through, through my early years in, in uh, Manchester. Um, the AA is uh, all the red parts on this, basically, for the last 10 years. So if, if I was to kind of char characterize, characterize my engagement here or the, the, the way work has developed, most of it has been about passion and, and love for design. And it's taught me, and therefore the practice has learned an enormous amount. And I think one of the key things we learned from 97, in fact, was that if we were to actually engineer a practice, a new way of practicing structural engineering, it needed three legs. We had the two. One was being able to construct on site, so contractors don't tell us how to do it. The other was to form a, an engineering practice that was orientated towards design. But the third and very important um, component of that stable third leg was the engagement with education, both the education of engineers and architects. So that, that was a, a kind of a, a coincidental event. So being invited by Patrick and Brett to come to DRL opened up a new area in our formative years because we'd only started the practice a year before. Um, I think there were three of us in the office, so I didn't tell Brett any of that when I first got here. So um, there's, there's other sides to, to the AA. There's the uh, kind of hair-pulling exercises that we've done over the time and, and therefore put back into the work. The DRL Pavilion last year, again, is very timely in terms of many years of work that's been going on here, but things that we're very interested in in terms of the digital technology. The, the rest of the, the currency is, is um, the other half, which is kind of what I've been trying to get the AA to think about. So most people here are, are totally engaged with the, the love side of it. There are very few with the other, the other currencies that we operate with. So Brett knows me for that. One of the first things I learned at the AA was how to do 2,000 years of research in a day. It's a very, very important message. Um, so I thought I'd start with uh, kind of positioning where I stand, certainly, and, and therefore the office in the world of engineering. What has happened over the last 2,000 years um, is kind of this diagram, very simply. Most of the time, we did not need structural engineers um, because the, the elephant on the left was carrying everything. As we approached the uh, early part of the last century, the, there was the birth of the structural engineer, predominantly because of the advance. Well, the Industrial Revolution was one, and there's many other reasons but mostly because architects decided to give away something that they used to do, I think. So we entered the scene, and being opportunist um, in that game, have therefore then almost played the game of being equals in, in many areas. The work that we've done, and what I want to talk about today, is in two halves. The narrative of the practice, and uh, putting a position on it, meaning we, compared to many of the other design engineering offices, have a pretty unique position. Ours is not about playing architect. It's about making the architect better than he is all the time. So it, it's, a, it's a very subtle difference from many other engineering practices or design-led engineering practices, but it's the one that we've learned from the three legs that I talked about. We learned early that one of the things we needed to do was to build a practice, was identify the key drivers, and these are common. You can get it off a website, but you couldn't work with all of it. So we have concentrated over years on the two most important ones. One is the quality of the work that comes out of the office, and the other is the innovation, repetitive and frequent innovation in the work. The rest of it is pretty average, and most engineers do. But those two things are very important to us, and we, we use as differentiators throughout. 
what motivated us to think along those lines really is, you know, this cartoon slide shows because like the, the other 2,000 years of research, this research um, shows that innovation has been dying, if you believe it. And, and generally speaking, this trend is right. So we felt that if we picked on innovation and kind of bolted quality to it, that motivational then would drive us to, to what we wanted to create as a practice. And then we tried to translate this across recently to you know, what is happening to architecture in, in a similar way. And you could read it either way. You, know, you could read it as a position where if we don't collaborate and if engineers like us don't support, and many clients who I haven't thanked, by the way, don't support or patron uh, the, the architecture, it could go either way from here on. And the credit crunch is, is part of that. But mostly, kind of the, the buildings that are coming out of many offices and, and the practice of architecture itself. Um, those motivations then led us to our mission statement. The mission statement was very simple. We were fairly, um, as, as Brett said, we were fairly organized, despite the fact that we give the impression of a, an informal organization. We based ourselves on a very simple idea of creating a studio that has a, a, an environment that, that's preconditioned in the way we work. And then from that, the creative and the innovative work comes out. So whilst it's a bubble, there's an, a, a huge amount of control in the bubble. But there is sufficient room in that environment for people to move around. And I'll explain that a bit more. To do that, one of the things was the mindset. And I always use this slide in the office to explain to people what we mean by the mindset. You know, if this guy, if you believe in the myth, if he, when the apple fell, if he wasn't thinking about the theory, he might have just ate the apple and we wouldn't know anymore. If you've got the right mindset and the environment, when the thing actually happens and drops on your head, you can unleash and actually create something out of it. So that's been a, a pretty important part of the, the organizational structure. We've stuck to that through, you know, understanding complexity science to some extent. We, over our first publication, we're trying to, to get somebody in to read what our success was and subsequently um, in an organized way, but mostly through being interviewed in the office. We came to the conclusion that most of what we do is kind of uh, about a swarm. So what our corporate identity now is trying to promote is also that idea of a flexible model that can change shape and adapt to any form. This plays out in the work because as Brett said, some of the architects we're working with, uh, how do we engage with those? Well, our position has always been to adapt to that derivative position of the architect for uh, the, the project. So Eric's office, for instance, thinks very differently to Fashid's office and so on. We have to be able to satisfy and, and be excellent in both of those conditions. And to do that, not just as a, as a total, but as a, as a kind of idea of practice, we need to be adaptable in one sense to have a, an aesthetic uh, appreciation for what's going on, but in another sense to stake out and understand better, say, for example, uh, practices like FOA. So our, our aim has been to, to work around that. And the book is um, about that a little bit because the difference between architects and engineers is we have to work for at least 10 years before we can develop a narrative. We can't theorize and then eventually, hopefully, build something. It's the other way around. So it took us 10 good years of uh, and fantastic collaborations with contractors, developers, clients, architects, and schools to really try and understand what it is we were trying to do. And we've used the kind of common term of design engineering. But what, what we've tried to do is, through that model now, we're beginning to try and redefine what the role of a structural engineer is. And if I was to pick on a, a, a couple of points here, it, it ranges from a project like the Pino Science Center, which is about complexity, to the, the organizational model here of, the organ of our practice, which we base on a spiral, which I'll explain in a second, to being engaged with the people who are in control of what we all do. You know, people like Commission for 
the built Commission on Architecture Built Environment, the BCO, also being engaged with teaching and feedbacking, feedback loops through that, and trying to understand um, social structures and what is happening to the world, but, but all of that feeding back to the practice of structural engineering. Um, there are many ways of categorizing the work, um, and we've tried that, but it's not, to be frank, it's been very difficult. Um, but we have kind of broken it down into the, at least the last 10 years of work. So some of the themes that we have learned from really um, the, the, the interesting architects that we've been working with. So this is kind of the language of the AA in, in some ways that is now unfolded into the projects that we've developed and you could categorize. The state of play for engineers has been for the last 10 years, we've gone from you know, that kind of approach to becoming forensically capable with the tools we have. So one of the biggest things that has made us um, smarter and better as structural engineers is obviously the digital tool and its use at a forensic level. So many of the excuses and logics behind the cause of practice or have to be pushed further you can do that now with the kind of computing power that we have. And uh, you know, I call it tools and weapons because in some ways they're also used as weapons. We've also found during that um, kind of discovery or narrative of trying to explain why it is we're successful or where we're get, trying to get to, is to follow up on all the other things that contribute to our work. We think the design process is very far behind where the tools and weapons are. Fabrication and construction is generally, in our opinion, um, interfered with and we are kept as designers at a distance by clients and contractors. So there is a, a lag, we believe. It is not true that engineers and architects don't know how to make and build things if you apply yourself. But the worst one is really skills and education. This is, to me, one of the big agendas. To play one of them out, you know, we were, when we were doing Wolfsburg Science Center, we did this map of what FE packages can do. You know, since from 85, something that took you several days in 2005 would take you a few seconds. So there was no excuse for not being innovative or producing quality. At the same time, we were watching you at the AA and others pile on you know, all the excuses for doing buildings, lots of different packages of software claiming that to be architecture or borrowing the nearest engineering idea and hanging the architecture off that. And the ship in that case is, is very metaphorical for me because when you put that much metal on it, it has no direction anymore. The compass stops working. We've noticed that in, with, with the kind of buildup of uh, software that's gone on in the last 10 years. And we're very cautious to the extent that in the last two years, we've tried to get our engineers, believe it or not, in workshops to hand draw again sketch, something that's been completely lost. So continue along that line. What is the wonder of, of digital technology? Well, one thing it's done without any question is it's eliminated past precedences in many ways. So if you take the, the core diagram of platonic forms and how all architecture can be done with this, that's completely now gone because what the software is allowing us is to morph these things an arch is no longer an arch and a beam is no longer a beam. You combine these things through and a number of projects that I've talked about here before are already doing that. So the wonder of the digital technology for us has been being able to do almost anything, anywhere, at, at any time. And I'll show you a couple of examples. The problem has been why? Why do we do this? The, the practice itself, um, and we show this at almost every interview and get a, a giggle, but it's now becoming uh, recognized. We set it up like this with um, a flat hierarchy with the three of us up there. And uh, the idea was to create a, you know, get away from this model of structural engineering, which is pretty unstable when it's picked up from the corner. What happens with this kind of idea is there's the potential of the designers, and we are design-led, at least Albert and I predominantly work on projects and avoid all the management side of things, are able to collapse very quickly and compress this model to be adaptive. At times, we're able to stretch it when we need to. Um, what's wonderful about it is the gradient. It's very shallow gradient between the different 
types of experience because experience is as important as inexperience when you want to be creative. Sometimes we found that the most naive idea is probably more creative than what the old guys are thinking about. So we've tried to work in this way in the studio. It's I have to admit it's got very difficult recently because we've grown up to 200 people and it's actually we're on different floors and you can't really switch teams. But it's got other benefits. You know, you can really stretch the thing when you want to share the profits out. You can drop this thing when you're partying. So it's, it's worked for us. The other important thing that we've done in the office through trying to build this narrative is to create a kind of polydisciplinary approach. Again, it's been 10 years. We've been trying this through what we're calling part in the office because we found ourselves in a position where we couldn't offer the fantastic service and quality of work and then say to the client, by the way, we'd like to charge you more for it. So what we had always wanted to do was really create a polydisciplinary group, which is kind of research, but not really, that would allow different centers, whether it's an analysis-led project or a computation-led project, to be injected into the work. And we call it part because we believe this has to be part of the service if you're claiming to be innovative and design-led. So that, that's been a, a response to the conditions we've found. And then, um, in a way, kind of going back to how you gather this information and create work out of it, um, staking out, I'm trying to move it forward now, bear with me, okay, staking out the architects has been important. We tried to categorize most of you into these two animals. The dolphins, which sounds extremely intelligent, but nobody else understands it. <laughs> the, the manta ray, which is a, a fish trying to fly. And, and we kind of worked this out something like eight years ago. And I la my dear friend, Lars Playbrook, has two cats doing this. And one's Rem and the other's Eisenman. Well, we, we kind of learned from this. And, and we found this to be quite important as a, as, a, as a way of choosing who we work with and quickly actually getting them in the bubble, but getting them to think that actually they're totally free to do what they want. It's not quite like that. And we go to extremes. You know, I've, I've just placed the kind of eight people that we work with fairly regularly here. And we try and work out where we think they're coming from. You know, the shortest thing Zaha has ever said that's interesting is she likes to make things look difficult, which is quite important because you've got to play to that tune. All the others here, you know, have got a completely different approach. And for us, as, as an engineering office, it's been important to put ourselves in that, in their feet, in their shoes, to try and understand what it is they're doing. It's quite difficult because I bet most of these people wouldn't speak to each other. But we have to act as some kind of, um, let's say, uh, organization that can talk to all of them, which, which has been part of the, the agenda for us in building up the narrative. Um, distorting things has been very important, and that's something I learned from the AA, part of the research. So depending on how you're looking at things and where you're looking at it from, you can twist and change things to say what you really want them to say. These are quite important uh, slides that I like because they're real and they're done by Sheffield University. Depending on what position you're looking at it from, so linking it back to the previous slide, you can distort somebody's thinking a bit more, play it back to them and create something interesting out of it. Two other things that have been formative in, in what we work with is the engagement with CABE, who, which for 10 years, um, the poor Finch and Robin here, um, has been quite influential for us, as it has for the whole industry, in wanting to raise the average of design quality. So patrons like this have been pretty important to us in forming um, the organization or building the engineering practice. More recently, um, I was fortunate enough to be on the Aga Khan Master Jury nine years ago. So it's, it's kind of a cave thing in a way, in that that organization has in a, in a different way, been doing this for 30 years. And m more and more, I've learned from them the, the humanitarian side of architecture and engineering. So whilst we've become super technological and super good at that stuff, the new trend in the office, at least, that we're trying to work with is, as, as we grow, 
is this kind of agenda of making the world a better place right across the world. So patrons like this have become very important in informing us as to how we should design our practice in order to respond to that. Um, in conclusion to the narrative then, um, I won't try and explain this slide because I always confuse people, but what, if, what has been, um, and I'm going to then show you the projects, what's been very important is how do you try and put this together into uh, looking at the work. And I think if I was to be, you know, fairly simple as an engineer, and we are very convergent thinkers, there is, there is an area or a zone that we've been operating it and thriving in, which in the States, most of the lawyers operate in. In this country, it's been the area where most engineers lose money in, generally speaking. So if you go for structural efficiency as a, you know, this is a very simplistic diagram on a flat plane, it's not true to, to say that something complex is structurally inefficient. Often, it's the reverse. Complex things make you work so hard, they're probably the most efficient. In a similar way, I think technological efficiency doesn't correspond with complexity either. So this conflict is one in the flat plane, but where we've been uh, very interested in, in and effective, I think, at every level, is adding the third dimension to it, which is the value, the qualitative and quantitative aspects, which has come mostly from our clients. Where these um, approaches fail is that they don't take much attention of value that we create for society or clients. So our box is basically this. Most of the projects we've been working in are the areas of compromise that we've found in all of this and then put a third dimension onto it by working with people like Land Securities and Stanhope, really large contractors like Bovis, um, and learn from these things. I'm then going to go into projects. So the first four, I'm not going to go into detail, direct links to AA, um, Zaha's Pheno Science Center, George, um, my colleague and friend, his first project that we were fortunate enough to work in Singapore with, FOA's first project, which has already been knocked down, unfortunately, in, in Ladbroke Grove, and the Peckham Library. Now, this is interesting because I've never explained it to many at the AA, you know, but I, I wanted to take this chance hoping Patrick was around, but he, I don't see him. He, he takes this, he's hijacked the word parametric, which at times has uh, wound us up a bit, because um, geometry and param parametric has been in the world of engineers, as I said to you earlier, for many years. Nonetheless, this project was very parametric, in that the sloping columns um, that you see were a very simple device um, that were set from a very um, interesting param parametric approach in that they're not columns and they weren't set on a grid at the base or at the top. What we did was we set a cylindrical parameter. So this is an extruded cylinder and the will also was allowed to move these within the cylinder anywhere in order to create a node at this point which meets at everything. So it's a very simple parametric thing that we did many, many years ago and has then you know, been expanded into the third dimension and so on. So I, I, I kind of uh, stretch on that a bit. Now, I'm going to go into the projects. I don't want to ignore, because there's always big projects for sure, but I don't want to ignore where the bulk of our um, learning has taken place. So when Brett says the, the, the architectural, sorry, the engineering office is very much an academy of engineering in the office and a learning environment as well, a lot of that has been done through you know, very successful, um, difficult projects that have won many awards and cost us a lot of money, just like all of the BA, uh, the, the, the AA projects. But it's been essential in actually forming what we want to do. Um, design competitions is the first thread of what I want to talk about. These are all with big, the IG. So having said to you that we stake architects out, the Aki and I have been talking for seven or eight years and working together on, with the office on numerous, numerous competitions. Uh, the first one we won was in Iceland a week before the country went bankrupt. So we're still kind of trying. And it's, it is very, very important to us to work on competitions in order to, to try and innovate. 
but that has led to our first project which which um, kind of is big it's very important because it touches some of the agendas of digital touches the agenda of hybrid typologies touches the agenda of what do we do in China never asking why we do it it was a, a competition that um, the Archie's office developed independently without any involvement from us to begin with and he's told the story of the people sign so this is a sign for people in, in, in China and the circle is the metal so for us it, none of that was really uh, interesting but we kind of hijacked our own agenda because for us it's a bridge and a tower put together and why it's important and, and it, for me immortal in a way is all engineers want to design a bridge and a tower before they die so we thought we'll kind of get hold of this quickly get it done early and we can live forever <laughs> so we've we've kind of taken it and, and uh, expanded and exploded it um, in many ways and it kind of starts to show you this whole discussion that we've had here at the AA about part and whole, how we connect the, the part and whole, not only architecturally, but also in, in the other disciplines. So we've, we've been able to take this tower, analyze it, weigh it through the tools we've got, look at ways of optimizing it. So the simple exercise of circle packing and how that could work as a bracing system uh, you know, through the tools we've got. But all of the time looking at the macro and micro scale of the tower I mean, you need tools like this when you're doing crazy things like a bridge and a tower at the same time. But we see a lot of potential in this, you know, in the future, hopefully, uh, maybe as a, as a utensil, but you never know. So there's, there's, a, there's a whole issue about why we do competitions and how far we take them and how we, in the office, create research in inverted commas. That can lead to other things. So the only other tower that I want to show you today is is Zaha's tower which the office has been working on we won the design competition probably four years ago three and a half to four years ago with this tower here and some of the the tools and um, kind of let's say in investigate because we never built a tower and this is the first time we've taken one this far we've got two or three and we're hoping this might get built so we had just bought uh, digital projects in the office at the time spent a lot of money sadly um, because we were told that that was the only piece of software that could connect architecture and engineering. Because everything that I've talked about so far, the big problem we had is that everything you draw with, we're unable to connect to analysis software. It's very difficult for us. And our part group often has to clean the models and you know, make it ready for the engineers to work. So this project allowed us to experiment a little bit with digital projects. It's progressing um, at pace now. Um, I should really show you this, this slide. What has happened is that as we develop uh, the analysis, we've discovered that the twist uh, is having a couple of effects. There's the, the lateral wind that you normally have, but also the, 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 the twist due to the torsional effect of the building. So we're, we're kind of enjoying this hopefully one explainable twisted tower, uh, at least from an engineer's perspective. These are Zahadid's uh, drawings in, in terms of how you rationalize the, the facade. Then I wanted to show you a couple of projects that we've lost um, the, to, to make the point about how you can work with this. On a very rare occasion, we worked on a shortlisted competition. It doesn't happen often with two teams for the Villadrome, with Thomas Heatherwick and FOA at the same time. And you couldn't get more extremes in terms of the first move in architecture. Both of these offices are very different. So w we don't often get to do that. We, when we're on a short list, it's usually with one. Um, so I thought I'd bring them along. The FOA approach of taking uh, um, pop art as, as the beginning and having done the master plan, they had a lot of knowledge. We developed a very interesting, what we thought was a brilliant scheme um, based on that, which kind of um, did all the things that FOA liked to do, you know, several things with the same diagram. The structural idea we developed based on um, this thing here, which is a bicycle wheel. And we, we pushed it quite far um, to give an impression at least of how we could do a large dome, unlike the big white one that's not far from it, with a structural idea. 
you know, with, with a more 60s idea developed further. Unfortunately, we didn't win, but I thought I'd bring it along anyway so we could compare it against, oh, we're going to take you to Dubai one day. You know. But I thought we'd compare it um, against some of the stuff that, you know, th th that we learned, you know, the construction sequence, how we could correlate these things against, at least for the jury's sake, um, the speed with which we could construct this, although we were absolutely honest on this. Of all the schemes that entered, we were absolutely sure this was the fastest one to construct. We did a lot of work on that. But in parallel, the office worked with Heatherwick's office to develop the other scheme, which I believe actually came second, um, which was a very different approach, the engineer solving a problem. This is it. How do you make it work approach? And we adapt ourselves to that. But nonetheless, with equal amount of passion and effort to develop it. What that does is really gets you into the game because we were desperate to win an Olympic project, obviously, like everyone else. So we learned a lot about the site. And then the competition for the F-06 bridge came out, which we entered with Hennigan and Peng, um, worked on, on what was the original F-4A master plan, F-4A allies of Maurice and, and Edo master plan, and took the landscape. So our bridge was with the Shifu Peng. We decided right at the beginning there will be six engineers entering this with architects. There will be the longest span, the thinnest column, the, all the architects will move. So we agreed from day one that we would do the Cedric Feist move, which was about getting to the other side rather than worrying about the bridge and what it's made of. So with that, Hennig and Peng were extremely gifted architects. We agreed that what we would do is actually make a place rather than take the bridge. Um, and this, this was the winning entry. Um, basically, our bridge during the, the uh, Olympic mode for 17 days is the whole space. And during the, uh, the legacy mode is that gallery-like Z shape. So, you know, there's a whole story behind all the other things we sold in terms of uh, recycled Reebok shoes to make stuff like this. But the, the, the winning idea really was to create a bridge, the permanent bridge, that can support the temporary landscape on either side, which really has very little structural gymnastics in it, apart from the constraints of the site are a problem in that there's a canal. So therefore, the depth of the, the, the longest span is very, very thin, or what we were offered. And this is the typical section through it. The structural idea was really to lock two legs and allow this to become a fixed-ended structure. It's the thinnest part of the bridge, not for, for wanting to be, but because it actually couldn't be any, um, any different given the constraints. And then the temporary steel spans onto this, sorry, over this, so this element never sees the big load during the 17 days. So the, this is now um, about to start, start on site. We've had, uh, like everyone else, a lot of problems with the, the dynamics of, the, of that span and have made the decision to actually put the, ax the, the device in to control the, the, the wobbles from day one. So we, we couldn't really resolve this in any other way apart from putting dampers in, and that's what we're going to be doing. Um, this is the diagram. Um, one of the most interesting, or the most interesting part of it is how we clad what we leave behind, because this is conceived as a stainless steel sculpture, almost like the Anish Kapoor Chicago thing, to reflect the sky from underneath, uh, also reflect the park and what goes underneath in the legacy mode. So. A lot of work really has been about geometry, very little about engineering or analysis. How do we tile this thing and eventually make a place that will hopefully look something like this? I play you the, the winning moment, I think, at least from my There's point. only five minutes to go, and Great Britain yes! are Olympic yes! champions! My word, history is made. I don't care what you're doing, stop it. If you're not standing, Get up on your feet, applaud Tim Foster and James Cracknell, cheer for Matthew Pinson, but take the roof off for the greatest British Olympian of all time, the greatest roar of all time, Steve Redgrave. So I play this for you for two reasons. One is the power of representation, we think is very important. 
and you know we see adverts all the time and they get to see eat burgers and chewing gum without us knowing about it and Shifu Peng had a brilliant idea that he got the people who make uh, adverts for cool beer to do the animation for this and that was our winning moment so aside from saying it's not about the bridge and it's about making the place I believe that the power of digital technology as a representational tool with the music by the way was the moment at which I believe we convinced everyone that this was the way to do it. So I, I wanted to kind of relax a little bit on the, the heavy tools of finite element analysis and talk a little bit more about just simply visualizing and thinking about the place we're making. So you get to see a little bit about the impression, what, what constraints we've got, and the same the steel underneath, which is going to eventually reflect the sky and the space underneath. So we're hoping that this will work more as a gallery, stroke bridge, and hopefully not to be managed. So moving on, some of the projects, new places uh, was the title I gave this next couple of projects, which Simon offered up this. We were very fortunate to, uh, to get an interview on, on this project, which really there's a lot of talk about the building itself, but in my mind is about making a whole new place. And I think the client um, with Jackson Cole and AHMM early on getting together to think about things before architecture, which is how to make a place, was actually the interesting part of the story. The rest of it is, to me, um, relatively easy now, having done quite a few buildings like this. But that said, um, AHMM had uh, the as most of you will know, in the housing world and in, in any other work they do, they work with very little budget on most of these occasions and do something out of it. I don't know where Simon gets his money from, but that's a, a different thing. So the idea that came out of it was really, um, if I can say, a, a, a factory that is partly a, ga part, partly a gallery, because Monsoon's headquarters needed to be more like a a place today where we produce. So the intellectual capital and the design of what they do goes on in here. You know, the display and the show of what they want to sell goes on in here. But obviously most of it is made elsewhere in the world in terms of the, the production. So as a place, it's quite an interesting challenge. As an office building, um, which, which is what our brief was, a b almost a BC or spec office building, what was wonderful is the kind of not being overly precious as an architect um, about the fine things allowed us to do some wonderful, um, amazing spaces, I believe, which everyone is very happy with. But I put it in here today because we tried the parametric approach to this. So we had to kind of convince ourselves that after Simon gave us the first diagrid, you know, how can we make that connect back to the work that I did with Ciro here on branching structures, you know, all the kind of crap that we try to do in, at that time. And how could we really put some materials to it and then see and test whether that worked? And it does. Some of that work was wonderful. So we looked through a whole series of column studies to, to get to this point using um, Katia, most of wh which got wasted because really this, the, the scheme was frozen very quickly. But the device basically allows us to open up what everybody wants to do, open up the ground floor a lot more and allows the potential of changing floor to floor heights if you want to do that, whilst actually freeing up the space inside as a pretty unique and special office stroke gallery. Um, a lot of the discussions were about whether it would cost any more than straight columns and hand on my heart, I believe it cost no more. We were fortunate enough to have Langs as the contractors on this who are very good at concrete and a lot of work from Wolfsburg moved across to how you know we were then seen as people who can actually engineers who can rethink concrete so there were the confidence building exercise wasn't so difficult in terms of the contractors input and we successfully uh, constructed this at, at speed. The second place that I want to show you quickly is in Margate which is a new Turner gallery which has been about a very different problem. Most of you will remember the unfortunate incident with the Snohetta's design in the sea, which never worked. Um, 
and they unfortunately lost the project. So the second design competition for a site here was one with uh, David Chipperfield Architects. We were subsequently appointed for, for that project as well. And it's been about uh, building very close to the sea and working with that approach in architecture, you know, David's approach, which is a, a very different thing to some of the forms, the forms and uh, approaches that the other architects take. So you wonder, you know, one of the first questions that I remember in early discussions with, with the office, the architect's office, them wondering why we wanted to work with them because there was nothing interesting in the structure. But it was kind of slowly important to convince them that actually we were trying to do good things and we had an empathy with their work as space is beautiful and they couldn't really believe us using words like beautiful. But anyway, we've done the, the, the problem with that kind of approach often is we, we ended up doing certain six schemes, I think, to actually find the right version. Arabs are the marine engineers. There was a lot of testing done uh, in, in terms of the waves that will hit the building and how we will flood or not flood our building. Tremendous amount of work on that. And we're now um, on site constructing the, the Turner Gallery right now, which is going to finally look something like this um, in about 18 months from now. Beautiful site, amazing place for Margate when we finish with it. Two other projects um, that shouldn't be ignored and are often ignored in schools of architecture, I call it bling and budget um, for the sake of ease. Housing and, and uh, um, prototypical approaches to architecture is probably the most done to death uh, way thing in that you know, ev almost everyone works on it and there's very little invention. There's very little you can do to improve the design and the quality of it. We were lucky in, in our first project with Phil and Fleck Bradley to be asked to work on the student housing at uh, for Queen Mary Westfield. A thousand bedroom in 90 weeks was the brief and design and build as the format. So the room for architecture, I call it 10%. There's no room for doing anything um, really interesting architecturally. You just had to lay out a thousand beds for students in 90 weeks. But the, the master plan and the discussions early on helped us to make something I think that has turned out to be uh, really formative in, in all the other work we've done subsequently in this, this area of architecture. So the, the, the tall building here or the, against the railway was to act as the buffer for the richer students so the noisy guys could live in here for slightly less money. And then all the, 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 the courtyards, uh, classical courtyards, would be for the more advanced students, let's say. And then a canal condition there. So there was a master planning exercise that we went through. But what was interesting um, about the project is this is the, the final elevation of the, the tall block, which in the end, actually, has become the most popular block. Amazing, really. But that's what architecture has the power to do. Why I brought it here today was th that we, uh, FCB had done a lot of housing and we hadn't worked with them much. We proposed to the client that it shouldn't go down the route of design and build. And that if you want to do it 90, in 90 weeks, the only real way to do it was by tunnel form construction, which is not new. It's not innovative. We did it in the 60s enormously. A lot of hotels are done. The problem was that in search for new, we forget to make all things shiny and innovative. And we thought just taking a tunnel form from the 60s and making it shiny again is innovation. We brought it back into this thing, proved to, to our client that one way of doing it was tunnel form. Fortunately, there was a French contractor who was keen on bringing steel shutters across to Langs. Langs weren't keen on this to begin with. But we eventually, through the tender process and a lot of nail biting as to whether we would get fired or novated, managed to prove that the only way to construct this was through tunnel form construction. So the success of the project has been um, about taking an old technology. So the innovation really is about a conversation and some experience and, and research in how you want to change perceptions. So student housing is perceived as an area where you don't need any architect actually. Most contractors can just knock this stuff up and very quickly. We challenge quite a lot of those things fantastically, you know, and this 
the nice thing about this video is that we were so quick with the frame. What it shows is the cladding didn't go up fast enough. So actually, we knew more than the contractor. He hadn't sorted out that gap between the facade and for whatever reason. But nonetheless, it was achieved in 90 days, 90 weeks, sorry. That work, that work has led to a huge amount of housing, which you know I can't talk about all of it and its range. But what it's done is allowed us to develop different systems from tunnel foam to bubble deck, precast systems, and so on. So we've almost cornered a, an area of work in housing. Um, and again, in parallel almost with that, we were working with AHMM and First Base as a client on the program for the London-wide initiative uh, in terms of social housing on the Adelaide Wharf project, which was years of kind of research, maybe a couple of years of just prototypical research being played out on a brownfield site um, using different systems to build something cheap and economical, yet, in my opinion, um, beautiful, if I can use that word. There's much we can criticize about both of these projects, but I bring them here because I think that these are still areas of, of work that people should be thinking about. There, there's more room to innovate and, and produce in, in what you think is already resolved by someone else. Sometimes you just need to reframe the question or ask a slightly different question, which is basically be creative. Um, what does happen, though, is disappointment. So keeping with the bling and budget, we thought we were so smart, we'd try and take that to Thailand with McCormack, James and Pritchard for the Bangkok em Embassy. So we turned up with all our fantastic option studies and all the things we could do. The problem was that we just couldn't get the construction people over there to the level of basic construction that we wanted to. So this has been not built in the same way. It's not certainly not budget. It's a lot of bling. And it kind of questions the idea of being able to transport what we learn in this country or what we learn from abroad to and fro. Um, now, two more projects, which are Heatherwick's projects, and they're about our role as protecting the metaphor. So the, the derivative position of this architect or artist is about creating a very simple metaphor on all our life is pretty good because this sort of approach takes enormous risks, many more risks than architects do. So we're kind of enjoying that. You know, we, we, that allows us to create more material for the way we're developing. Um, this was the, the driftwood concept, something kind of floating in from the sea as a cafe was Thomas's um, idea, I believe. For us, it was an opportunity to take um, digital projects again and see if we can find a way of doing the whole thing out of six millimeters of steel plate. It wasn't for any other reason apart from the fact that Littlehampton Welding are the local steel fabricator who happened to be two miles from the site. So we knew that the only way this could be afforded is if Littlehampton Welding were willing to lose some money. And to do that, we'd have to work it with a six mil plate. So there's a, there's a kind of a, a huge story to it, but the, the fundamental thing is about trying to get something done and getting somebody like Littlehampton and Thomas and us together in order to create interesting stuff. We did a lot of work on it from analysis to, to unfolding of the ribbons using DP. The problem we found with DP generally has been that as soon as it goes out of the office, not many other people can use it. So as an office, we've almost abandoned the Tia digital project because most fabricators are unable to, to translate it. We have to redraw it in microstation. We have to reanalyze it in a different way anyway. But a very simple structural system which comes out of cross ribs into the purple elements which form the geometry, whilst in the other direction the ribbons span onto it. And it's you know, been another kind of seminal project in terms of the publicity and position it's gained for us as an office. Also in terms of developing a fantastic relationship, this is a, a fabrication shot in Little Hampton Welding's yard. So you see the, the ribs that form the the form, the shape, but also act as the transverse support beam. And then the thing constructed and on site nearby. Finished extremely successfully. Now, the second metaphor is the Shanghai Expo, which has um, <coughs> probably the, the quickest way to tell you is it's all about English glass. 
that was the metaphor. How can we take English grass across to Shanghai Expo? Very simple idea um, on a site like that. How do we create a, a pavilion in the middle of it? We won this as a competition, um, a very hard fought competition. Um, and how do you create something interesting? So the, the basic idea is about an object that has these, well, there were 100,000, now there's 60,000, yeah. 60,000 spikes on an object um, that moves, but also has the ability to respond not only to media, meaning what we project onto it in terms of British culture, but also how it responds to wind potentially, and also some technological challenges in terms of what do we make these spikes out of. Uh, for Thomas, the whole thing, including the underneath of it, needs to be made out of the spike, whatever the spike will be. So we're at a stage where um, it's very detailed construction, but at the competition stage, we had to play the totally dumb guy because in this scenario, with the jury and the sort of competition we were up against, we had to play the kind of very safe pair of hands and the office developed a kit of parts, IKEA diagram for the jury to say it was actually really like doing an IKEA thing with lots of AKT staff. Um, we've tried bom bamboo, which hasn't worked. Currently, it's an acrylic spike, about eight meters. And currently, um, we believe we're going to take it all the way around to the uh, underneath of the, uh, of the object. So there's some debate in the industry about whether that's going to be done in time or not. But we'll keep fighting for that. Um, and it, it, it's involved us in a lot of research and pushing learning about Shanghai and what we can do over there. Um, these are the construction sequences and how, you know, we've looked at a number of options of how you might actually support the whole thing. So it's pretty simple. Next title is Green Aesthetic. I want to show you two projects in this because it's obviously a well-used, well-hijacked word, sustainability. It's a very difficult one for structural engineers because our part in it is very small, really. It's mostly about the environmental uh, engineers or climate engineers, as they call themselves now. Um, we were fortunate enough to be successful on the Mazda project, which is a zero carbon city, Austrian partners. The first, I mean, most of you will have read about its credentials in, in terms of the photovoltaics, the infrastructure. It's aiming to be, through, through all this research and a huge number of organizations have developed the research. But Foster and Partners have done the master plan that is aiming to make the first zero carbon city. Um, we, are, we were interviewed um, and won the first block, which is now on site, this block here, which is MIST. It is the university building, the equivalent of the MIT. So this is where the core will be in terms of the intellectual capital of, of the development. The first people will move in there do the research to build the rest of it out. The, the building it, itself has three layers with a lot of transportation and things underneath that we can't do in an existing city. So there are many credentials in terms of its uh, sustainability discussions. Um, what's been difficult for us has been the, the speed with which we have had to take it to construction. Um, these are just images, so there's nothing kind of amazing about the structure apart from the fact that we're building three la layers of podium and flat slabs, but the speed, I think at our interview, killer question was, we know you're really good, but we want to start piling in eight weeks and we don't have an architect, you know. So, to which we responded and won the job and started piling much later than eight weeks. Um, so, second one on the green aesthetics, which I always find fascinating. You know, it's on the Brunel site in Swindon, and it shows you something about engineers in a way. You know, we really, when we're allowed to play architect, we really make a mess. I mean, why is our building orientated that way? It makes a lot of sense. Anyway, so moving on from that, it 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 was a competition f with Phil and Clegg Bradley um, for the National Trust's headquarters, who are the keepers of the heritage here. Um, so one of the key components of it was it should be the greenest building. And really, it's not 
um, it's, it tried almost everything from a menu-driven approach. And it's done almost everything from deep floor plan to light wells and, and all the rest of it. But for us, one thing it's done as a structural engineer is go back to trying to, to kind of categorize this area of work. Which is, we call it smart localism because what you need to do in, in the, the sustainability discussion like you do when you go abroad is really go right back to the basics, you know, where the bricks were made and where the steel is made and how we get things to there. So we've learned how to unlearn, which is one of the things that I talk about in the book, you know, the importance of actually being able to unlearn very quickly when you arrive at a project and not to carry the baggage has been pretty fundamental in this project. Because it's a very simple portal frame shed um, with photovoltaics on, on the top. The, the big things are, you know, we use sheep's wool and we've done big courtyards, naturally ventilated, um, suspended a thermal mass underneath a steel frame um, to get the coolth in here, and then used lime mortar, which is an old thing, brought back so that we can recycle the bricks. None of this is amazingly um, innovative, but for us it was a learning exercise on how we might actually take the dis this agenda on further into any contribution structural engineers can make in sustainability. Under patterns, I want to show you a couple of very quick projects. This is um, well published now. FOA is uh, John Lewis's with the cinema block next to it. I, I should say that we were involved in the competition from the outset. So the, the engagement was neither of us had done a shopping center. And we were invited with four, against four other teams to, to produce this. Um, and at that point, it's very important to have worked with this sort of architect for many years because there's a kind of a subliminal connection to the way they're thinking and what they would like to construct. The idea in the end is, is I would rather that FOA talk about it, but it's, it's a whole huge number of agendas. How do you build a, a tra semi-transparent box next to an opaque box, which we didn't know the program of when we won the competition? It might be a bookstore, it might be a cinema. How do you create or persuade John Lewis's that opaque is no longer the, the department store because they did one of the first transparent department stores 50 years ago and then department stores have gone towards becoming opaque so they can get you concentrating on the shopping and stack more up. So one of the challenges was about how do we convince them to do something semi-transparent. Um, the competition was based uh, also on the work that FOA had been doing on um, ornaments, how do you use that? And we conceived the idea that lace, which is originates over there in Leicester, plus the demographic uh, position of Leicester is such that there are a lot of Indian ladies with saris there, Sashid said, when she walked around the, the competition uh, visit. So she, she was kind of um, into the color and the patterns of all those things and connecting that somehow to a semi-transparent skin. Now that's that's all the theory behind it, but there's a, it has been super successful. We went on to actually be appointed to construct it together. So we weren't dumped at stage D, which is what often happens today. You conceive something and somebody else delivers it. And it's been, unfortunately we tried ductile and other materials for the lace, but sadly it went back to a screen printed glass in a double skin. Um, which works, and this is a prototype on site that played with the colors. So this is the Christmas color, I think, and then another color for summer sales and so on. So the pattern was very, very much about many agendas performing at, at different levels. But the thing that kind of uh, made it difficult for us was at the competition entry stage, FOA had said that they would want to make it read as a single sheet of glass. And we said, yeah, that's all possible. You know, of course it's not possible. You have joints and you have things that will show, you know, as a, as a pattern. You will break this with black silicon all over the place. But relentlessly, you know, they forced us to, to change that. And, and I have to say, you know, the easy answer was to make the joints wide and just get on with it. But they pushed us and pushed us to a point where we made the, the most narrowest joints possible, together with Celia, who were the 
fabricators. So through the prototyping and, and analysis work that was done for the glass, the joints are so small that you actually read it as a, the continuity of the pattern goes across without you seeing the glass where it's jointed. Um, quite difficult, but you know, basically works as a, a suspended glass um, assemblage from the top. So, oops, back slide. There's a very simple gallows bracket at the top of the system, um, which hangs the whole, the whole thing in, in glass up and down. So there's a suspension bottom-up sequence that we had to think about. But that gave us the, the thinnest joint. But what the other clever thing was that the panels themselves, which are 2.5, 2.4 by floor-to-floor -floor height, each panel is not supported vertically at every node. So one of the smart things was actually to, in the walkways, introducing a lateral tension element. So we, we pull the glass together in this direction and only support the vertical load every other panel so that we were able to, so that's vertically supported there and there, but that one isn't. It's completely free. We tension this up tight so that the whole thing doesn't fall away that way or push and pull in the other direction. That allowed us to construct effectively a very, very thin joint and couldn't have been possible without the beginning of the lecture. The constructor, the architect, and uh, the designers working together, really, to achieve what we all wanted, convincing everyone that that's what needed to be done. That's carried on in the pattern, so we're now working and on site just about with the Ravensbourn College with a different approach to pattern this time where it is a bit uh, Penfold-like geometry. The college is a design school, and the idea this time is about using a very simple geometry that allows us to open and, and close the lens throughout the elevation so you don't read where the floor plate actually is in it. We're on site with Bovis on that right now. I wanted to show you the real engineers' projects, a couple of them as well, um, hardcore structures. This is Leicester theatre with Raphael Vinoli's office. Um, the big thing is about the theatre. So there are two theatres back to back, and the whole idea is about being able to see this, the back of the, the theatre from the outside. So when the performances are going on, you can see the back elevation, and you can see the performance backstage from the outside. So our challenge really was about no structure inside. So most of the work is done by four cores and really serious, huge a bridge almost on top of the roof, which is something like a 26-meter cantilever that Albert did. I didn't have anything to do with it. So, so this, this has all been about grunt, hardcore steel fabrication and engineering which I, which I learned in the early days of my career and been extremely successful as a consequence of the, the way in which the architect conceived the theater, but also the way the Bovis and their team pulled the whole thing together. The facade is suspended, and it's had its opening recently and been super successful both at the theater and as a new space in the center of Leicester for the client. Um, I, ha I have yet to see the performance. So continuing along that line, currently on the table is, um, again, a competition win, a very simple hardcore engineering exercise for the New Street Station in Birmingham. This is the image, um, the very simple idea of cladding an existing building to with stainless steel, mirror stainless steel, to bring the sky in. So basically the idea is that we put a very thin layer of steel, stainless steel around the whole object if I go back a second, around the existing building, which is enormous, so that it reflects everything apart from bringing the sky into the city. It also shows the train movements in certain elevations. So it makes a kind of dynamic form on the outside that is picking up the sky and other conditions around it to make an active facade effectively that changes every minute of the day. Very little in terms of engineering. Um, new structure, let's say. On top of it, uh, a new atrium that we're going to insert. This is on the table right now, and uh, we're going through the, the stages of construction with MACE. 
But our work was really about facade engineering. How do we bend at competition stage, fold or use the facade um, stainless steel material to create the interesting um, geometry. It's not a Gary geometry in a way, in any way. It's a very performative geometry. How do we actually deliver something like that on site to respond to, to the city of Birmingham? This, the structural engineering is relatively uh, easy on the new side. The complexity is all to do with how do we construct up against an existing structure in the middle of the city while the station is still running. So we're going through that stage right now, um, hopefully to, to start construction in the very near future um, of some of it. I wanted to talk about computation a little bit and, and at this point thank also all of the team from AKT that was involved with the, the exhibition in there. Marco Ranucci, the curator, Rob Partridge, the engineering director, but Paniothis and Savako also specifically, although there were many others involved, who've been involved with the very interesting computation work that the office has been producing that's thrown in there. But I wanted to take it back to eight or nine years ago. You know, it really, for us, it started with Southwark Station where we did the first ever project for, you know, this is a B-spline curve with a triangular glass sheet with McCormack, Jameson, Pritchard, and Alex Bileshenko, now well published, but at the time a very difficult thing because what McCormack wanted to do was change the tile height each time. So this dimension changes as well as curves. The steelwork behind it is very simple. The, 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 the micro macro discussions on analyzing the glass and the knuckles at the same time are all part of the, the debate. But we computed it using software um, writers, not us. You know, one of the things is that we don't, if you want to be an, a, an expert, you don't necessarily have to become the computer scientist. You just ask them the right questions. That's the skill that architects and engineers need to develop rather than trying to always compute in one way or another. So in this case, using um, very simple software, we were able to schedule and unfold every piece of triangle, 590 that are different, so that the risk disappears. The connection of the triangle at each node was a very simple device, an arm that actually translates and rotates at the same time to pick up a geometry of that scale. So if you imagine the triangular glass piece with a single hole in it arriving, it could arrive in anywhere in that envelope. With this device, you could pick it up. So we, we the, the eureka moment in a way, although I don't really believe in those, but the point that sorted out the, the geometry was the translation between the curved glass and the steelwork behind was this device that allows us to rotate, translate, and push and pull in the other plane, the directions, so that we can actually clad any B-spline curve like this. Only mistake we made was not patenting this damn thing because it's been stolen by so many people since, but anyway. Um, I wanted to show you the other extreme, which is Hyde Rally in the Barco with Zara's office. Um, well, I'm not going to answer the why question, but th this is the building that we've been working on for some time. It's an amazing exercise in terms of, I mean, it's fantastic space that we're developing in there. Um, but the, the problems for us initially were really understanding the geometry and using the latest scripting and computational ideas in order to find a way of simplifying the facade and, and tiles. But also trying to deal with high earthquake areas with an asymmetric form that's, you know, curvy linear, in as curvy linear as it can get, which has tested us enormously, uh, particularly in that part of the world. So the work that was done in the office was about, uh, by um, our op part group, was about trying to stabilize the geometry and kind of find how you tile this thing automatically. These sorts of things could not be done 10 years ago. They would take too long. Today, they can be rocketed out and you can, it's kind of uh, connected to the RL10 because at one point we were studying the fiber C as the sheet that will cover but this is the material that's been produced in terms of fitting different types of tiles onto that shape, trying to um, then connect back to a very simple steel frame in the background. 
and, and you pick on, on small areas to study and see what extremes they give you and then apply that to the whole. So that whole discussion about whole and part comes back into how you do it. The engineering is you know, nothing to, to get too excited about. It's all about what shape we end up with in the end, really. Um, I'm coming towards the end now. You'll be glad to know if I can move forward. Okay. Okay, this is the second last slide, which is the office. It's all about the human transaction and really the environment that I go back to. This is people from AKT that I wanted to leave behind um, because what everything we say and talk about wouldn't be possible without all of these people. So th the thing is motivating them and actually having, as I said, a narrative and a direction that they believe in because these are the guys that push us to actually keep doing the stuff we do. Um, I wanted to finish with the, the very last slide, which is, which is a, a tribute to Jan Kapliki. The, the last time I, I saw this slide was here, and he showed it. And the other last two kisses for my wife and daughter who should be in bed by now. Thank you. I was nervous. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready for questions. Any questions? Yeah? Thank you. Thank you, Hanif. Uh, should we take some questions? Can I open it up to the floor immediately? And let them all take a deep breath. There is a question here. We're just waiting for a microphone. So. Uh, Hanif, a fantastic kind of synthetic um, exposition uh, about the relationship between you know, architecture and structure and construction. And what I'm wondering is whether at a kind of level of analysis and when you're presented with challenges, whether because you've synthesized these things as engineers, how you kind of create the project yourself. In other words, at what point do you create it as an engineer? But then at what point do you say, well, actually, I've experienced this as an engineer in relation to an architectural project or in relation to you know, something I did with Lang 10 years ago? Is, is there a kind of, can you kind of keep these things discreet or do you take advantage of the fact that you can kind of see it in a multiple way? I, I would say personally at least, I'm sure people in the office would all have different answers, but certainly I work very closely with Albert and we think similarly on this. We try to be all things at the same time. So at every step of the way, even during a competition, that could be dangerous because we end up blunting some of the creativity. We will talk very quickly about you can't build that and these are the reasons why you can't do it. Sometimes that can become an issue. So for, for at least the guys at the top, the thing we're trying to put down is that through what we've done, um, we have to be able to monitor all of those levels, the construction, the design, the aesthetic, the beauty, and, and actually be able to crit each one of those irrespective of the audience. And I think that's where we've had a wonderful relationships with many architects who've introduced us to developers. That's how it happened. Because developers have often wanted to get the best out of the architect and been stopped by the engineer or the contractor or something. And that's happened for us at least um, from our narrow world often through being able to talk about you know, beauty and architecture and geometry and how to build something all at the same time. And I think it's the only way of the future because there's a, 
you know, it's fairly obvious thing to say as the blue collar workers move away from here to India and China, the thing that's keeping us in the West sharp and to the forefront is that creative edge. And for you to know, to be able to do those things, you know, reinforce that side of our brain, you need to have understood all the potential problems that, that occur when you separate and put seams in design and construction and production. Just one follow-up which, which arises from um, a lot of the projects you've shown, which is the question of, uh, is the sort of push-pull. A lot of what you've described is, is that a problem has presented itself yep. and you've uh, addressed it. But there's another engineering story, which is actually things that are happening in the technology that you can deploy yep. or the research coming out of engineering itself which means that it can be applied. So it, it's not you simply responding, it's you applying. And I wonder whether the balance of that, is, is, does that go in cycles or do you see that changing in some it, way? I mean, the worst thing, well, it doesn't go in cycles. And, and the worst thing we find is when we are asked to be architects, and that's usually by the bad architects. Most of the good architects are fairly good engineers, we find. So. They, they know, broadly speaking, the technical prowess. And often, that's a given. You know, you're expected to make it stand up to budget and all those things. The discussions we have and some of the developers and contractors are about how to make it that much better without that destroying that third component of my concluding slide, which is the value and cost of things, and, and really maintain a spatial stroke aesthetic empathy with the work, which I think is the fundamental difference between the design engineers. There are many of the design engineering office that are playing top-down engineering. Th their engineering becomes the architecture. We're not there. We're actually very clear as probably the best structural engineer in London that wants to do an empathetic thing with almost every architect that will entertain us. That's, that's the position, basically. the students would give me a hard time, but it's you then. Um, just had a small question. Um, as you've been going through the projects, it looks like um, you've had uh, some projects initially which were very like small and very detailed on quality, but as you progress through the years, it actually become larger, more challenging, and uh, what uh, architects want from you is like more demanding, I mean, in terms of what they expect. How do you see that? I mean, what, what's next? Um. I mean, fortunately for us, the recession has arrived, which is in a, in a way a good thing because <laughs> what that means is we're going to have to shrink ir irrespectively, but also re reposition. As I said, you know, for us as engineers, you can't create the narrative. It's been a look back at what's created the, the work and say, how do we take that forward? I think one of the problems has been the office has grown enormously. Therefore, we've attracted lots of work that's more and more sizable, and often quality has suffered as a consequence of that. It's a common thing that all engineers have. I mean, we see this as a challenge now, and I don't think we would have gone down that route if it wasn't for the recession. We just carry on growing like all the other engineers in the world. But in some ways, this is going to test at least our narrative or, or claim that we want to be innovative because as you shrink the scale and as, you sh as the budgets get tighter, that, that is the, the only thing that will survive. So what I see next is more of what we did in year five, hopefully, well, not quite that, but you know, more of the challenging, innovative, difficult things because that's the only place that people like us thrive in. You know, most of the, 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 the good structural engineers would find me very offensive as I talk like an architect. This is, you know, they're straight guys. John might have something to say about it, but he's gone. But, they, you know, it's a very difficult conversation at the Institute of Structural Engineers. They don't recognize this kind of practice. So for us, it's still important next about pushing younger engineers into rethinking the discipline and making a choice on whether they want to be like us, empathetic but very good structural engineers, or like others impose their engineering on, on architects. 
uh, I think we've made the choice, not just the two of us, but the other directors, Paul, Jerry, and the others, all believe in this because they've been there for uh, so many years. I'm wondering if there might be another d dimension to the work that will be challenged by the way the world's changed in recent months, which is, and, and I, I've only had a chance to reflect on it since you've put together these kind of presentations of the first 10 years. It's an incredibly local practice. Yeah. I mean, in the world's most globalized capital, let's say, a, a capital defined by the flow of people in and out, what you're showing in every case is a very close collaboration between yourselves and an architect up the road or a group of students down the road, or young emerging offices that are really at the forefront, like George's and Chris's, the others that you've worked with that we'll be talking about in a few years' time with much bigger buildings, but they're incredibly local. And, uh, and I was running through your list. Bjark is in Copenhagen, yeah. so he's an hour away, and Vignoli is down the road now with the London office. And I'm wondering, first of all, how deliberate was the strategy of keeping things local at the beginning? Did it just emerge out of the fact that London architectural culture went through a wave starting in the mid-90s that gave you a great pool of talent to work with? Yeah. And what do we need to take into account now that international finance isn't any longer flowing the way it has been that might then challenge a next wave for you guys? Yeah, I mean, the answer to your first question, it was very deliberate to yeah. be in, in Clockenberg. We drew a mile radius, and there were about 100 architects. Yeah. So easy picking, as simple as that. It was a not much more complicated. This is the second thing that's associated with that and very important is London is unique in its culture, not just the architects, but the engineering culture. It's pretty unique in the way it works with architects. And we have now traveled the world, looked at everyone else, and we, we don't think that we're going to change. The loc you know, smart localism, because we are actually moving our agenda across to the Middle East and other places, Oh, we might not be as effective in these places. We're doing stadiums in India now. But what we're sticking to is actually doing the typical creative design-led projects rather than kind of just breaking into another vast infrastructure engineer. We won't do that. So the international component is going to be fascinating, as we found with George and Singapore. You know, it is difficult. Some of these cultures cannot engage with the culture of design, I mean, here. And, and people will just reproduce an idea. So what we've got to keep doing, I think, is uh, being creative from London. And if that engages the rest of the world, which I think it will, because most of the world looks to London to, to lead in design, I think. Thank you, Hanif, for a very interesting lecture. One of the slides, actually, that interested me is uh, the third dimension, which, which you probably, in a sense, it was one that the role I played with Davis Langdon. And it, I just noticed that you're one of the first structural engineers to think about design efficiency and uh, cost optimization while you're doing all this creative design. My question was going to be, did you find this to, to have... Uh, uh, an impact, a huge impact on the program of a project? And secondly, how did the communication work with the client, the architect, the contractor, you know, and so on? It, it, um, <coughs> despite the kind of uh, informal approach to the process, we have a pretty uh, set stages of work, and we're very thorough at the front end, which is unusual because most consultancies, uh, I mean, those who understand stage B, will not invest in the front end because things will change. We've actually always done the reverse. So one of the things we've tried to do always is do a lot of work up front, compare options, write, you know, try and bring in as much knowledge at the front end to hopefully then make the rest of the process easier, say, and more um, predictable rather than sit back. Because if you get it wrong in those first five minutes, the curve never straightens out. So we have a pretty rigid process in the office that has been demonstrating, you know, and that's why I keep saying you have to do it for 10 years before people believe you. We kept saying it, but we've proven it now over the 10 years that actually you can do amazing stuff with very little effect to cost, let's say, and still get great value in terms of design.
Hanif, you, you spoke about tools and weapons as being fairly strong, but the, the fourth arrow was skills and education. And I'm wondering if you could maybe give the architectural educators in the room or the architects a, a sense of your perception of the lack of skills and education that's going on. Um, I think there's a, it's a massive gap between the best and I, I seriously believe Korea is, is probably the best, or at least in the top three, uh, in terms of schools of architecture. There's a massive gap between that and the next tier. And it's only the fortunate kids who get to come to this place. Most of the work that, that is done in the world is not by those kids. You, know. you don't actually get all of them, um, you know, with the exception of a few obviously, that, that suck away from, from these schools. So I think the gap is, is much worse and bigger, and it, it will now become even more apparent because if you take Obama's agenda or whatever, you know, the, the next uh, forms of construction we're all going to be involved in is very much infrastructure-led, um, which you know, requires you to be very inventive to do something interesting. Budgets are tight, and it's a difficult <coughs> thing to do. They're not commercial projects. So I, I would say that the gap has been enormous, um, it's actually not as bad as I make out to you. It's much worse in our world. The world of engineering and, um, for example, um, the institutions of structural engineering or the universities that are teaching good structural engineering is shrinking enormously. And in the case of service engineers, which is a mechanical engineer, it's non-existent. Most of them are, are pretty bad when they come out of university. You know, it's, it's, it's usually a problem. So when you collapse those three disciplines together, that's when you get a building, right? So I think there are gaps in that. There are gaps in manufacture and construction that are enormous that we're seeing at, at places like the Olympics and other construction sites that are going on right now. And I, I don't think these are close. We can't close these things. That's part of the problem now. I think we will stop there, and I will just remind you all, we've got the bookshop open downstairs. Please come down and have a look at the book, which is on sale right now. Hanif, thank you for coming in for the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.